Welcome everybody to Ty, Ty Romper's No Limit Podcast. This is episode four. We have a very special guest on today, one that I am very, very excited about. Uh, this is a woman, Dr. Taylor Burroughs, who has a PhD in marriage, couples, and family counseling. This is a woman that is a retired mental health counselor and marriage therapist. This is a woman that inspires tens of thousands of people every single day. I'm one of those people across all social media, helps us out. She works as an online coach, consultant, and matchmaker. Uh, this is a woman that I'm so grateful to have on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining. Dr. Taylor Burroughs, welcome to the pod. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing really well. I got all fancy for you. <laughs> so it's always nice to get dressed up. And then and then I was wondering, are you going to be shirtless on all the podcasts? So I am who I am, right? Yes. Like I, I got to stay true to the brand. <laughs> to be honest, it's not even really a, like a brand thing. This is just, I live in Vegas, man. It's, it's, you're in Arizona. You get it. It's sunny all the time. I don't wear a shirt much. So <laughs> this is who I am. That's cool. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Always. Could you maybe give the, the viewers just a little introduction about yourself, let people ho know who you are? Sure. Well, uh, I guess the most important thing is I'm a retired therapist. So I used to be licensed in marriage and family counseling and mental health counseling. So I retired a couple of years back and I've been working solely online for myself uh, as a coach, consultant, matchmaker even. So it's really just transitioning into a different uh, way of helping people that I find I could be more myself, more authentic. And I've really been getting better results for the most part. I mean, navigating the online world can be a bit tricky. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit <laughs> later. But, um, you know, for the most part, I keep my business really small and I've got my clients very intimately so that we're aligned and we, we are all in good spirits and, and we get each other we can be ourselves we can kind of you know be honest and transparent I mean for me especially right because I bring myself into my work a lot but um yeah it's just been really nice to transition into that space that's awesome can I ask when you kind of made that decision was that something hey you kind of mapped out in your head I want to get to my online space you know my own kind of doing my own thing yeah you know it, it was interesting because I was a little bit ahead of head of the curve, I guess is a way to say it, um, before COVID and everything. And that was really motivated by Dennis, right? Like, so Dennis and I met online, oh gosh, I think it was in 2018, uh, in the summer of 2018, like we kind of, you know, connected somehow on Twitter because we had mutual friends. And then I started asking him questions and I was interested and it escalated to a point of vetting, which is what I, I teach a lot in my work. And then because I wanted to relocate and trans like transition my business into like a global nomadic kind of enterprise, he inspired me because I really wanted to get my personal life situated and I wanted to, to really just align my personal life with my work. And so that's how it got started. And then we went traveling and COVID happened. And so then I was already all set up. I was ready for it. <laughs> so it was good intuition, I would say. It was, it was meant to be. Uh, one thing you mentioned in there that I really would love to touch on is you mentioned your vetting process. And this is something yeah. that I think a lot of people could have a takeaway from. Okay, what would you advise any woman or any man out there that's watching this, what it kind of goes through your mind when you're going through a vetting process? Well, you can, it's kind of, I've started this hashtag, like always be vetting, you know, like <laughs> there, there's one for every, every industry, but it is important to think of it as more of like a paradigm shift. So it's really how you see the world and not like it's the only thing, but <laughs> it's an added layer that you put onto your lens so that you realize that you have to be intentional about what you invite and what you attach to in this life. Right. So you don't just get a job because, you know, you need money or, or you need cloud or whatever, like you do it for a reason. You look at what the core values are and what um, the likely outcomes will be. How will it facilitate your goals and all of that, right? Like, so it's with anything, with what neighborhood you live in, what, what job you have, what person you're going to be spending your time with. Um, so it, it's a sort of a holistic view that you should take. And with relationships in particular, um, I try to help people shift that thinking from dating. I kind of like, I just sort of go with the flow or whatever happens, like I'm just feeling it out as I go, you know, to more intentionally getting to know people, being curious, understanding what they stand for, what their character is, the personality, what they want out of life and all going well, like obviously the, the, the attraction and the emotion is the easy part to assess, but it's whether you actually would make 
appropriate teammates for a long duration is what is the difficulty people have. So really putting that at the forefront instead of like as an afterthought. That's a, that's really wise that you say, because I feel like a lot of the guys I talk to, they get hung up on this thing, right? Oh, well, she's really pretty. She's got 19 red flags, but she's really pretty. And, we, and at the beginning of the relationship, right? All it is is kind of physical attraction. You're joking around. Life's easy. So you're kind of shifting people's minds into thinking more about that long-term teammate kind of thing is what you're saying. Then. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some people will push back and be like, well, what if I don't know what I want or what I'm ready for? Then I'll say, well, you don't have to be like, I'm not telling men that you should be like ready to get married and get, you know, meeting people like you're a woman seeking a wife, <laughs> like a woman would seek a husband, you're a man seeking a wife. I'm not saying that. Now there are you know, people that can do that because they are ready. Maybe they're a little bit older, but uh, for the most part, it's just really clarifying a lot of the, like all of the drama. So you're able to, to have a healthy, however long it is, interaction, even if it's not quote unquote, a relationship, if you're able to really get to the, to the meaningful connection from the beginning and get to know a person. It's not about getting a result that you want, like getting them into bed or getting them into a relationship, but it's really just, I wanna like get to know this person. They seem like really interesting to me. I'm drawn to them, I'm attracted to them. So it's really honoring the person and the potential uh, connection that you can develop. And then if not, it's also okay. And you can walk away, no harm, no foul. That's, that's really cool. That's very healthy boundaries. It sounds like that you, you help people set uh, one, one of your favorite YouTube videos and you have a lot of awesome YouTube videos that uh, me and my wife have browsed and, and watched a lot was uh, how to, how to reject someone. Uh, and I found that really interesting because as men, it's very hard, right? Like I remember the first time I approached my wife, I took a shot of whiskey and walked over and I was like, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna be the man and invite her on a walk afterwards and whatnot. But uh, do you have any tips, I guess, for maybe guys that are going to go approach, especially in now this day and age, that can be kind of challenging. You got that rejection of fear, all that. And then maybe take it from the other, the woman's perspective and say, how could you let guys down easier? How could you, you know, can you kind of talk on that for a little bit? Sure. Well, I think, you know, if you're courageous enough to approach a woman, <laughs> you're already in a good position because a lot of men aren't confident enough or just the way context is. People are just feeling so um, insular and detached. So if you are, then you're already getting your foot in the door and I think you're going to make an impression. So um, a good a good impression, hopefully. But um, yeah, I think it's just about instead of trying to play a role or play a part, really just looking at connecting to them. And um, sometimes the simplest things <laughs> work the best, you know, like it's just, it's just going up to someone and saying, hey, and uh, asking them a question, like being curious, like it no it communicates that you're noticing, like you're observant, mm -hmm. if like, you know, either they're, they're, maybe they look like they're waiting for someone or they're reading a book or they're eating some food or <laughs> they're, they're walking the street, whatever it is that they're doing, you want to make a connection so that it, it shows that you're observant and you came up to her for a reason, not just because you want a number, <laughs> you know, or she's a pretty girl. Like um, there has to be something more authentic that you reference, right? And so I think it's more about being yourself and getting comfortable, even just in the awkward, <laughs> embarrassing moments of life. I think that speaks to people, like when you can just sit in those moments. That's beautifully said. Me and my wife always have a thing where we say we want to stay curious too. Like we've been together now uh, seven years. Sorry if you're watching this, honey, maybe eight. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that's the thing is we always want to keep dating each other, we say. And like, I'll even before we go on dates night some nights, I'll Google like strange questions to ask a date or I just want to find these new things out about her all the time and, and keep it interesting in that way. I know uh, you and Dennis have been together for a while and stuff too. Do you have any like fun kind of date ideas or, or things that you guys do together? <laughs> Yeah, we're always thinking of new things to do. We have like a, a monthly meeting. So like a check in, I, I, I talk about that too. I have a, it's cool because it wasn't my idea to do it. It was, it was Dennis's idea to implement it in his way because he's very organized and structured and, you know, like he's got Excel spreadsheets and stuff like that. Like he's, he's all of that. And I'm all of the sort of like 
free spirit kind of side of things. I'm not as organized, but anyway, so it was his idea to implement a family meeting monthly. And then I kind of squeezed in like the relationship stuff, but he's like, we need to do one new thing. We need to go one new place and we need to go over the, you know, how effective we were with all the things that we needed to get done. Um, and I'm like, well, and how are we doing? And what could we do better? And what could we, you know, celebrate more or be more, you know, meet each other's needs better. Um, and so it's a nice, blend of both elements but I think that when we sit down and actually just give ourselves an opportunity to brainstorm some things that might be cool to try you know that's how we got into rock rock wall climbing we haven't done it outside <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah the the rock wall climbing is super fun so anything active we like to do he's really into combat I'm sorry I'm making weird gestures but he's he's into combat um lessons and and shooting and stuff like that but I I kind of I don't really I've been a few times but um to the shooting but he can kind of have his his man time when he does that and and I can kind of do my spa time um, when he goes to those places but we like to do those kinds of um hiking and adventures uh active things together or with other couple friends so I mean, I think just be creative. We went to a whiskey festival last weekend and that was fun. So you can use like Groupon or Yelp or um, Google app uh, map. <laughs> uh, I use those things to like find new events or even Instagram. Like you can find cool things on all these apps. The algorithm helps you, it reads your mind. It will tell you what you wanna do. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing, a couple of things to touch on there. My wife uh, and I, we have kind of like where we audit so to speak, our relationship too. And we kind of talk about, hey, how can I meet your needs more? How can you? And, and that's always a special time. We hire sitters every week and carve this out too, to where it's, it's always movement based. We usually take a walk, holding hands. It's kind of a nice thing. Then you're connecting and you can talk about some of those deeper issues. Cause I see that as a problem with some of the men I coach where they haven't been on a date with their wife in 10 years. They just all their whole life is, becomes transactional, right? And as you have kids and responsibilities and jobs, if you're not careful, it can just be did you pack lunches? Did you take the garbage out? Did you do this? And so I feel like what you kind of alluded to there is, hey, carve out that intentional time, put it on the calendar, right? Like every month where you kind of have that time where you can talk about these deeper level things. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It, and I don't know much about your wife, but from what I picked up on, she seems like she's a saint. Obviously no one's a saint, but you know what I mean? She's like <laughs> yeah. super busy. She's doing lots of stuff and uh, she's very community-based and, and trying to help people. So she's got to be you know, busy and multitasking. <laughs> Always. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, you, you mentioned with you and Dennis where like, he's the organized one and he's the, and then you're, that's where the, like, I'm the just creative. Let's I'm a dog. I wake up every day. I'm a dog and I chase things and I smile while I do it, you know, and I kind of have no plan around stuff. And, and he's very much organized, ABC detailed, and she is the best person I've ever met. She makes me better. And it's, uh, yeah, grateful to, to have matched with her in that way. You know, I, I feel like God kind of brought us together because she makes me a better person every day, which is, which is a pretty amazing thing. I've seen one thing I want to mention too, is uh, yeah. one of your favorite videos, Dennis, you're doing a handstand, which I love <laughs> you. I love all your stuff. I'm very jealous of you in this regard. I've been working on this handstand for like a year. So I need some tips on that, but you're doing a perfect handstand. And then he opens the door and you don't break stride at all. You just keep doing your handstand, talking in your video it seems like you guys have a really good and kind of like goofy relationship too. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm a very silly, goofy, playful person. And, and I think a lot of men can be, but they maybe present more controlled. And so they're more guarded at first, but when you have the right chemistry, it's really beautiful to be able to open someone up who may be that type of personality at first maybe it's introverted it's guarded it's a lot of different things but um yeah he's he's definitely we have good playful energy together and um I, with the handstand thing like people walk by all the time so I've actually had a lot of accidental practice at it I wasn't always like able to keep my focus but unfortunately I have to hold off on the handstands for a little while I had an MRI last week and my neck is all messed up. So I've got some bulging discs. I got to back off a little bit, but taking care of myself and slowing down is not always a bad thing to slow down. It's okay. Very true. Especially when you're in this kind of online world, you know, you mentioned at the beginning where, you know, when you're creating your own stuff and that's something I've actually just talked to my wife, about. I led my first men's retreat and I came home and I slept 11 and a half hours, 11 hours, 10 hours last night. It exhausted me and, and I told her, I got to take a step back and be more intentional about, I can't just say yes to everything, right? So 
how have you kind of navigated that world as you've shifted in and, 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 you know, had those boundaries set and things like that? Um, you know, I think I kind of started already with that in mind. Like I, I, from my real life world, things got so sort of intense because I was, I was sitting on the commission for mental health in the Cayman Islands. So, um, like the government has like the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Finance, you know, it's an English uh, British system. And so I was the deputy chair of this mental health commission, which was a big responsibility. And we were dealing with writing policies and dealing with laws and I had enough. And so kind of when, <laughs> when I started my business, I really set out to make things smaller and simplified my entire life like I got rid of everything so I was moving country so I sold things I gave things away I just dumped things and I sold my truck and wow. I had like four suitcases when I moved well I was transitory so I was staying in Airbnbs I got a, a storage unit put my couple of bags in there and I was just kind of playing it by ear and seeing what was happening and so my business was really it needed to be easy to run. That was like light. Dennis calls it a light uh, business. And so um, I started betting, like it was between the personal and the professional. It really solidified my approach and how it made it easier for me to be so specific with my message. You know, I think people kind of have like a good idea as to what I represent because I've been consistent with it from day one. And so I'm just kind of giving you a little background as to how that happened, because, you know, I'm 42. I've been through a lot of different stages in my life and I've achieved and I've explored like different careers in regards to uh, like acting and modeling and volleyball and all these other things. So at this point in my life, it's like really knowing what you want and recognizing that you have to make sacrifices for it. And you really need to go all in, in order to make it work. And so for me, it's not about crazy amount of money. It's not about big bells and whistles. Like I really just want to be happy, healthy, stable, <laughs> and like, self, I guess, freedom, you know, being autonomous, being able to make my own time and stuff like that. Yeah. What about for you? That, that's honestly, I'll probably watch that back five times and take notes on what you said. Because that, that was really great. That was really beautiful. And I think for me, yeah, I, I had, I was managing a bank and probably making more money than I would have been doing stuff on my own for a while. And uh, it was really getting intentional too with my wife and just saying, you know, I'm not living the kind of life I want to live. And like, we just had to say like, you know, at the end of the day, just, just buying a more expensive chandelier really add to our happiness <laughs> or does me being home more add to our happiness, you know, right. and, and does driving a brand new car add to our happiness or does, is does like having money in the bank and more freedom add to our happiness. And so getting really intentional about those things has been big. And then the big thing for me that I, I always recommend everybody do is I just write down five pillars of my life. And those are the only five things I'm going to win at. I got faith, family, fitness, finances, and friendships. Anything else I'm not going to win at, I'm not going to, I just, I have tunnel vision on only those things. Those are the things that provide me fulfillment and happiness. And that's all, that's what I'm going to focus on. I see too many people throwing darts. They're going to, they're going to chase this dream for one minute, then this one, the next. And I agree with you. You have to have that tunnel vision and say, I'm going to be consistent at these things. So, you know, can, can you allude to, has fitness kind of like, <laughs> fitness for me was the catalyst. They say it's a gateway drug to self-improvement. And that's been the case for me. Has that been the case for you too? Yeah, it's always been like a priority in my life, except I say always, but <laughs> there was a period when it wasn't when I was first in college, like I think those couple of years I let let fitness slide. Um, and I regretted that and then I had to get back on track and, and then it was it was good. It was a process. But um, I'm in the best shape and health that I've ever been in at 42. So oh. I, I figured something out. <laughs> but um, I think now it's just about one I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, accepting the aging process in a way like you, you can only do so much. Right. And so I think it's just recognizing that you don't want to be complacent, but you also don't want to be resistant because there's a lot of gifts that come with the aging process. Right. Uh, if you do it right. And so I'm I've from maybe three years ago or four years ago, especially, I've been really thinking about more holistic, alternative, wellness-based, preventative things. So now I'm doing like 
well, I was doing the chiropractic stuff, the acupuncture, um, different, you know, supplements and just looking at various things to do in order to maintain and optimize my health um, going forward and avoiding a lot of traditional medicine as much as possible. Uh, we're in the same boat there too. And yeah, and I agree like playing the long game with health. Like I, I don't want to be the world's strongest man. I just, I want to be a healthy, high energy dad who can, you know, do, and I think like having those clear goals too, because I could look back at myself 10 years ago and say, I'm maybe not as strong on bench press or, or some of these things, but do I really, again, does that really affect my happiness day to day? I think it's just being mindful all the time of those goals, you know, is the biggest thing. Yeah. And I don't know if this is relevant for you and your podcast, but I think too, for women, uh, we have to consider other things as well, right? <laughs> and so it, 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 I won't say that that I guess I was a tomboy and just being an athlete and stuff like that, but the fitness and the all that sort of uh, aesthetic uh, stuff being a priority really drove me or vice versa. It's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. Like I was driven to to be fit and to do all that sort of real vigorous activity. but, as a woman, and especially, you know, once you get up in age, it's, it's getting too late to maintain and optimize your fertility and your hormones and all of that stuff. So you kind of have to slow down and you have to do things differently in order to make sure that you're healthy in a holistic way, hormonally and all of that stuff. So interestingly enough, now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm eating differently. Like I used to be non-dairy, but now I'm really trying to introduce more full fat dairies mm -hmm. and uh, co collagenous meats like <laughs> ribeyes and, you know, fatty meats that, that give me extra collagen and all that good stuff. And li literally just slowing down, doing more meditation and yoga and stretching so that I have more of a yin energy because it's more the feminine aspect. So, you know, the yang stuff, the, the, ambitious, uh, more masculine activity I'm comfortable with, but I'm actually trying to focus on the feminine energy. It's really cool. And what I hear mostly like from everything you kind of talk about is how mindful you are and how you're kind of constantly in your head auditing and, and kind of mapping out where you want to go. Okay. What's it take to get there? Maybe at one season in your life, cause you, you were a professional volleyball player, right? Uh, you traveled all over the world playing, right? <laughs> yeah. Not like at, at the elite well, it was the elite level, but I wouldn't compare myself to the people that I admire, right? Like we were, I was from a small country. So I was that on our team and we played against them, but yeah. they're just so amazing. You know, like I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a fool to think that I could beat them in a game. Like we played my, myself and my teammate played the Cuban team who played in the Olympics this year and the last time. So the last time I played in the tournament, I actually played Olympic that's awesome. Were they semi-finalists or something? <laughs> so it is pretty cool to think about it. But yeah, uh, I haven't played in a really long time. I would love to get back out there and, and play for fun. So for um, you and Dennis, uh, just have a date night where you go hit some volleyballs together. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's okay to have a little bit of a uh, jousting and com competition between you from time to time. It's like that tension and teasing that you need. Yeah, for sure. But I think like when you're, when you were training for that, it was obviously looking a lot different than kind of how you're waking up now, a lot more meditation, a lot more, a lot more holistic. And so you've been mindful of that as you kind of transition through seasons of life. And I think that's so critical, even, you know, we, we've been fostering now for a while. And there was a season where we had two babies for like six months and me and my wife just didn't sleep. And so it wasn't going to be like realistic for me and my wife to get up and go deadlift and go pout, you know, like right. be very mindful those days the workouts looked like a five or six mile walk and some stretching and some meditation together before bed. You know, that, that was the workout and being mindful and okay and allowing yourself to be okay with that, I think is one of the biggest things, but I see a lot of people struggle with yes. that. Um, is there any tips you could give to anybody who might be, you know, struggling with something like that? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head, right? Like this is what I meant by accepting the aging process. It's really about being adaptive and flexible and resilient, right? Like in order to really survive and optimize your potential, you have to be flexible and you have to uh, take a pivot <laughs> from time to time. And if you don't, then you're not gonna make it <laughs> to, to be cliche. So yeah, I think that's really important. And one of the things it's humility, you know, it's, it's letting go of control and surrendering to the process. And I'm sure faith plays an important role for you and your wife, right? Like that's something that can really 
yeah, that that will really be helpful in a marriage and in a relationship, or even if you're single, right, to help you accommodate and respond proactively to any kind of changes that you have to adjust to. I think that's yeah, having kind of like a bigger guiding principle than just your own how you feel that day, right? Like that, that's what we always talk about is I don't, I don't really feel like working out a lot of days, but I'm, I'm disciplined enough and I have this bigger vision in my head of where I want to go. So that's why you do some of the things you do, right? Right. So what I would suggest to clients in general, just as a little example, um, I have them go over like their mission and their core values and vision and purpose and all of that sort of stuff. And a lot of times people get fixated on the specifics and they're too, they're, they're too small. And so I tell them, but maybe that's not your core value. Maybe the meta principle is bigger. So it might not be like weightlifting is your core value, but movement and activity or, you know, momentum is your meta principle. So you're always going to be active and doing something, but it doesn't have to look the same every day and whatever you can do, you will find a way to do something that you can do. And this is why I resonate with you right away too, because all the stuff you talk about, like, you know, we're in the Twitter space together. We share kind of that community, right? And I love it. Most people are just building everyone up and it's a great community, but we, we've talked a little bit off platform and stuff too, how it can be a competitive space, right? And I can post some days that I just took my family for a walk and played at the park and had, a, and I'll always have these guys in the, that's not what men should do. You should be this or, you know, and it's like, dude, you do you and I'll do what works best for me. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about like that competitive space and how, how, how sure. you navigated that a little bit? Because to me, I mean, man, there's just people that say it's only my way. It's only my way. And we all have different paths. We all walk different journeys. And my thing, and I think yours too, is you got to be mindful about your own and, and set your own path. But can you, can you allude to that a little bit on? Yeah, on sure. I, I'll do my best. I think, you know, for me, <laughs> I started blocking, I don't know, <laughs> quite early on, and, and I have a lot of blocks, and I think it pisses a lot of people off, and I really don't mean it in a personal way. It's about me. It's about my energy and my attention, and if I'm worried about what you're saying and what you're thinking and how you're interpreting me or what you're doing with the information, because a lot of people just misunderstand you, and I'm not talking about just anons. I'm talking about mutuals, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> like this sort of Chinese telephone thing that happens on our Twitter circles. It's very high school and I just I, I I really I don't like it so I just block people when I get a sense of like icky energy and it's not personal like I said it's more about what I'm feeling and what I need to do in order to keep focusing on what's constructive and effective and healthy for me yeah. um and so, so I don't know I don't see a lot of things that happen <laughs> in our Twitter verse so I've blocked like 860 now I think is my number I'm up to and I'm I'm the same my peace is going to come above anything else right and that's even in real yeah. life I've I've blocked real life people just the same as I've blocked Twitter people um so I agree with you there you got to guard your peace above everything else um yeah, and the interesting thing with my work, I don't know how it is in yours, maybe I'd love to know more about your work. I know you did that retreat last week, but for me, I mean, even though I'm not, I'm retired and I'm not like a therapist anymore, I still prioritize confidentiality in my work. Like the way that I approach my work is an interesting sort of blend of a background in professional clinical work and like this new sort of independent consultancy, but I still you know, use a lot of the professional ethics that I was trained in. Like, so it's a blend of those two things. And my supporters are very silent because it's confidential work. Whereas I see like some people like you guys, you know, like with Zach Hommel and, and, and your, your group of men, like you're all very vocal and you're like shouting each other up and doing all this. And I'm like, you know, when somebody gets a, a, their, what do you call it? Like their knickers in a wad or whatever about something I say or something that is done, then it becomes like this, this sort of gossip circle. And then I feel a little bit and I don't mean to like, you know, make us think of it, but it's hard because I don't have people who are very vocal about all the work that I do do with them that is beneficial. And so what you hear is mostly negative, but I find that's kind of like an example of how life works. We hear a lot of the negative stuff and we hear very little of the good stuff. That's a good point. You turn on the news and it's like, you know, there's a million good things that'll happen today. They'll only talk about, you know, 99 out of 100 will be the negative things. And, and I think some, some part of our brains are designed that way too, where I can have 100 people even DM me. Thank you so much. This is a tweet I needed to hear. This helped me. And, and like the one guy who says like, 
I hate you and this and that, that's the one that'll stay there until I actually practice like getting that out, you know? And I don't know why that is, but it's just like almost human nature, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think you're, you're right. Like you have to actively not just um, protect yourself. You have to have a practice of like, you know, preparing for that, but then also detoxing from it too. So <laughs> that self-care is so important, whether that's, you know, going to work out or playing with your kids or going for your walks or praying or anything that, that is, is sort of detoxifying all of that negativity, right? Definitely. And I think anybody, you said it best, you have to prepare for that ahead of time. And like, I'll be honest, I was naive. And when I started making the decision to post on Twitter 19, 20 months ago, I had no idea I would grow the, the community I did. I, I remember writing a goal. It'd be cool to have a thousand followers. <laughs> you know, that was my goal. Like, um, so I didn't know anything about it. And, you know, I remember that first time I put a thread out on, on just how much I love my wife and how much she supported me, how I hunted her when I first found her. And I was, you know, she broke up with me, like, told me it wasn't going to work. I wouldn't accept that, you know, <laughs> like, you know, all these things. And, and I remember waking up the next day to like three or 400 messages from these alpha males telling me this, you're a soy, you're a this, you're a that. And it's like, dude, it, it kind of made me realize I need to take a step back and prepare for this ahead of time. If, if you're going to continue yeah. to grow on social, you have to understand if you put yourself out there, a lot of people are going to resonate with you and like your message and, and, and really gain from it. And that's why you do it. But there's also going to be a group of people who, let's be honest, they just wake up miserable. And if they see something that you say, they're going to project their negativity onto you. It has, it's not even personal, right? It's like, they probably don't even think about you that long. They just spew hate your way. Then they see this other thing and they spew hate that way. And like, that's how they go. Yeah, you're right. And I think too, there's this sort of um, undercurrent, I don't know, people post about it a lot too, of like playing the game. I don't know. Have you picked up on that? Like people really? talk about like how it's all a game and you have to program or be programmed and uh, all this sort of stuff. And I, and I think there's, you know, it has some validity, right? Like you have to be intentional. You have to be confident. You have to create that somewhat of a, that shield. Right. But at the same time, I feel like there's, there's a balance that needs to be struck, a line that can't be crossed because you can't always be persuading or, you know, <laughs> trying to be intentional about the, the outcome that you're seeking. Like it's not a zero sum game. And so I think that for me, there's a balance of being a good person, but not being naive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you, you, you should look for this tweet if you didn't see it, but some, one of my clients once um, brought this video to my attention and it was exposing game theory. And if you know anything about game theory, oh, game theory. I'm a poker guy. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So it's a video that goes through like the different players and which ones win and which ones lose in perpetuity. If you keep spinning the wheel um, anyway, you got to look at it to see what it is. And so it really focuses on like, um, it, I think the copy kitten is the way to go. So the copy kitten is cooperates until you hurt them. Uh, numerous times because they're able to process and understand that some misunderstandings and mistakes happen and they're able to accommodate that versus someone who's just always vengeful or vindictive. Uh, but you know what I mean? It's like that, that yeah. balance between being a good, kind, humble person. And this is what I'm, what I'm connecting to is those guys criticizing you being soy, right? <laughs> like, you, there's nothing wrong with being kind and gentle, especially as a man, that's part of healthy masculinity, but you, they don't, you know, you don't want to be naive and like weak, like right. that's what they're saying, but that's the line. Yeah. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, for me, I have a process now where if negativity comes in, I literally, I always try and give them a little kindness back unless it crosses a line, you know, like we, there's some people just say the most hateful stuff. They wish that you and your family die. And you're like, okay, I'm just blocking you. That's it. You know? Yeah. But most of the time I just try and say something kind back, say a quick little prayer for them. And then I give them one more. And then if they come back negative again, it's just, they're, they're going to the block to, to the abyss. You know, that's kind of my, my strategy around it, but I do agree. And, and I've talked to other females about this on Twitter that they're like, I wish the women had more of a like built up community because it is tr like, if somebody attacks like Zach Hamill, or somebody attacks me, usually there's like a big group that will like rally around and be like, nah, man, this dude's great. We love you, bro. We love, you know, there's, there's kind of that. So I don't know, maybe, maybe we can, we can start to, I don't know. I don't know how we can do that. I'm going to think on that. We need to build and empower the women up too, man. <laughs>
Yeah, it's very clicky. Like there's, I have my women's group, for instance, it's very small, but I know that there's groups, little cliques of women here and there, and there's people that, you know, they don't get on <laughs> between one group and another. And so it's hard with women. It's a lot easier with men. Women have more, more covert social yeah. systems and <laughs> men have more overt direct ways of confronting problems and resolving conflict. And so for me, like I'm a very masculine thinking woman. So in the work that I do, it's a lot of problem solving and conflict resolution and management. And so that's how I approach things, um, except when I block someone because I'm just like, this is just too much, too much uh, static for me to even, like if you have no, no place in my life, like I'm not gonna attend to that. But I think there is a place for men to lead women in that way, you know? So if, if we can help facilitate some effective communication with women, that would be well received. Maybe, maybe that can be our goal moving forward after this pod. Let's unite every, I just, I just like us, like that community mostly just wants everybody to win and do well. It's, it seems to me like almost the one place on earth where like everybody that I interact with there just wants me to win and do well. I want them to win and do well, even though kind of, we're all kind of, going for the, some of the same clients and things like that, but nobody really cares. We just figure, hey, let's just build a bigger pie because there's billions of people that are our potential clients. So who cares, you know? But it's true. You have to have that abundant mindset. Like you can't think that it's it's zero sum again. Like it's not, I win, you lose. It's we, we all can win. There's more money, more opportunity, more clients out there. But I think it's when people have differences of opinion they have a hard time separating the, the opinion from the goodness of the person or the value of the person. It's like, you can disagree or you can not see eye to eye, eye, to eye but you can still sort of respect that the person is, you know, I don't know, just doing anything that they want to do and they're a good person still. That's a great point. And, and that alludes to even a bigger picture for me of like, man, we're just so tribal now. Like if you turn on the news, it's like, it's the, the, rich versus the poor, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated, the black versus the white. It's like, we just can't. And, and like, why can't we just be humans? And, you know, like I, I don't, you know, I follow 400 people on Twitter. I probably don't align with 70% of what some of those people think, but I, I respect some of the message they say. I know I can learn even people I don't agree with on certain politics or certain things. I can still learn from them and I can still respect their views and understand they just have a different background, different thought process and way they are. And that's okay. But that, that sometimes frustrates me quite a bit. I will say of, Oh, I'm just going to put you in this camp because you yeah. believe this and I, you know, I, you're done because of this. And I, did, do you ever get kind of frustrated by that as well? Absolutely. But you know, the language too, is I'm hearing a lot of trendy talk about like finding your tribe. Right. Mm -hmm. So th this is the line that I think it's dangerous when, you know, you go too far in something and then the tribalism, happens. So you want to find aligned values and people who you feel at home with, but then you need to prevent it from becoming Lord of the Flies, <laughs> which we see a lot happening, right? That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's something to be very mindful of, I think. Um, hey, I want to talk about one other tweet that you had that I, I would love you to expand on because I brought it up to my wife and I, I just love your thoughts. You said your partner's stress language is just as important as their love language. Um, I would like this just personally for me to help me out because, you know, me and my wife talk about love languages. We know each other's love language and, and talk about this and try and fill that bucket with that often. But can you talk about what that means and how to identify that? Yeah, sure. I went into it in depth um, in my newsletter last week and I've gotten a lot of good responses from it. So basically uh, I came up with it when we, we were talking about something, uh, I think in my women's group. And so framing it as like a stress language can be so helpful because you realize that you you react to things differently it may not be better or worse right it's just that you react to it differently just like you express your love and expect love in different ways too and i think it's also contextual right like depending on a lot of the men that responded to to my email said well i might fight in certain cir circumstances i might flee in certain circumstances or i might the other one is freeze or fawn so those are the four categories that i use so the fawning is the one people don't really know much about but it's more sometimes more of a feminine i would say it's feminine not necessarily female reaction because the feminine 
vulnerability may come out in a man and he may fawn, which makes him the nice guy. So if fawning is like people pleasing. And I think a lot of um, men who are spiritual can tend towards this uh, often when they're feeling emotionally overwhelmed or insecure. And so then they want to um, take care of the other person's needs over their own. So be mindful of that, um, that it can be contextual. You might exhibit those four stress languages, all of them at different times, depending on the emotional overwhelm that you're experiencing. So you might go to fight like a, like a dude in the bar if he tries to do something to your wife. Um, and then you may, you know, sort of shut down and withdraw, which is the, the flight, right? Like mm -hmm. you flee the problem, you flee the emotional overwhelm by shutting down or the fawning. So those are the four. Okay. That's good. That's, that's pretty helpful. And, and understanding that with your partner and then also understanding when they might be in these stress times and how you can help them get out of that is probably a pretty, pretty important thing. Exactly. You have to support them through it. So sometimes you need to give your partner, and, and this was an important point that I, that I made too, is giving your partner space does not just mean giving them distance. Giving them space also means bringing them closeness and affection. Mm -hmm. So it's really good to be able to communicate I need space to be with you, or I need space to be on my own, um, or I need you to listen, or I need you to help me problem solve. And so being able to identify what you need and to ask for their support, it's not like they are the only things that are going to fix it for you, but you want them to support you while you process what you need to. That, that's perfect. And that's something me and my wife have definitely worked on where I've tried, you know, I just, tell, I can't read your mind. <laughs> so we've got to, we've got to communicate better, but there's definitely times where she'll just say, Hey, I, I need a night to myself. Like, just give me a big hug. And I just, I just want a couple hours to process what I'm going to process. And then tomorrow we'll talk about it. And we'll, and a lot of this, is what I'm thinking about is like the foster it's, it's been a harder journey for us. And you raise a child for four months and you, you give them back. That's a hard thing to process, you know? And so she'll just say sometimes, Hey, I need this or that. And then another times I'll see her kind of down or stressed. And I'll just give her a big old bear hug. Hey, let's get on our knees. I'm going to pray for us real quick. And then you let me know what you need and kind of go from there. Right. And I think it's all just, as you said, kind of, kind of guiding that as, as you go and seeing, Hey, every individual thing is going to be different, but that communication aspect is everything, right? Cause we can't read each other's minds. So important. And uh, I mean, you just adopted your son, right? I think we I did. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And actually uh, pretty, pretty cool news in about two weeks, we'll have a, another big, big announcement, which I, I'm not allowed okay. to publicly by okay. laws here, but uh, if you can guess what that announcement will be, it, it's uh, yeah, we're really excited about that too. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. I'm so happy for you. Yeah. And uh, we just decided too, we're going to open another bed after that. So, and open up a, another child. So yeah, we're, we're pretty excited. That's something my wife got me on board about. Um, many years back. And it's been one of the biggest blessings for us, for sure. Speaking of abundance, that's just like love and abundance, right? That you're, you're connecting with. So that's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been an awesome thing that, that abundance mindset and that I would love to talk to you a little bit about that too, because man, that's, you know, a few years ago before I got into really self-improvement and all this stuff, I used to hear people say this, like, abundance mindset and it's all starts in your mind. And I think you guys are crazy. You know what? <laughs> and then once I started really getting into this, I realized, okay, there's a reason every single high level athlete, high level CEO, high achiever is obsessed with mindset. Um, and, and, and everything kind of goes back to that. You have to see it in your mind and you have to do that as someone who's, you know, competed at very high levels of sports been very successful in a lot of these things you've taken on. Can you kind of speak to that and mindset and how important that is? Sure. What I will say first off is it's got to be congruent with your behavior, right? So you can go at it both ways, but ultimately you want your, your thoughts and your behavior to match. Or otherwise you're going to get stuck in a position of cognitive dissonance, right? Where you're telling yourself all these great things, but you're not actually following through to align your behavior with them. And this also parallels the whole conversation between systems and goals, because, you know, you talk to some people and they're like, goals, goals, goals. And you talk to other people and they're like, no, 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 systems, systems, systems. <laughs> so I'm a very middle of the ground. I don't, I wouldn't say that. I would say I'm all about like integration. This is a much better way to describe me. So I see both sides and like the objective benchmarks in the extremes and then all the gray in the middle right i see both and it's really important to to keep in mind that mindset is great but don't forget 
putting it into action. So tell yourself all the affirmations that you want, but you better have some, <laughs> some habits that you're developing in order to make them real so that you, you gain that competence and that confidence in that you are bringing it to life, right? And so it, it, like if you are limited in one area, focus on the, the one that you're weak in, right? Like if you have to play with that and experiment with what, what you can leverage to get the outcome that you're seeking. Yeah, I think until you're, you know, like you said, you can get up and say daily affirmations. And if you just go about your day and do what it, it's not going to matter. I think when your words kind of align with your faith and what you believe that bigger why behind it, and then your actions, when those three align, I really feel like it's, it's unlimited to where you can go or where you can get to. Um, as long as you're walking that out every day and just moving towards those goals. Right. Yeah. And, and your, your, Physi physiology is really powerful, right? So as much as our mind can impact our body, our body really impacts our mind. And that's why health is holistic. That's why, you know, people who take care of themselves look better, right? That's why we're attracted to, to good genes. All these things are connected. So the more that you're able to, um, like th there's an experiment or research done uh, by Amy Cuddy, well, she presented it in her talk, let me be clear. And she talked about this research. Have you seen it about the power not. posing? Uh -uh. But basically it comes down to hormones, right? So like if you're able to like model your, your body, like behave in like, let's say nonverbal body language. So you do power posing, it actually increases your testosterone hormones and it decreases your cortisol. So you feel wow. more confident. Wow. So the, the, the physiology, like your, the way that you put your body changes your, your mind because it changes your, your hormone levels. Wow. And there's also been research after that, that contradicted it. But the whole point that I'm saying is that it works together. You can't do yeah. one without the other. You have to consider it connected. And so mindset, but also <laughs> physiology and behavior, that, and it will cool. all work together. Even on like this last men's retreat, we had a guy who was, he was trying to set a PR in deadlifts, right? And so he had 335 and he couldn't do it. And my buddy, Jeremy, who's a fantastic coach said, you know what, man, go walk outside and go get your mind right and visualize yourself doing this. And then he goes, just walk up and do it. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. He did. And that was 35 pounds more than he's ever lifted. And he did it with ease. And we just like changing your environment, changing your physiology. And I always say too, when I used to work at the bank and I get really stressed, that's why that five minute walk outside is so powerful, right? Like you go put on a good song, you let you just take yourself to a different place. Then you're kind of able to come back in there and have a, a level head and go about that. You know what you need to do, but changing your exactly. environment and physiology is so important. I think. Definitely. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think abundance mindset overall is part of the, the equation. Um, and a lot of people sort of, you know, things get popularized and then it gets diluted <laughs> and they kind of mess it up. Right. But it's not about being just, um, fanatical about things. I think that, that you have to maintain perspective and understand that, um, you don't take things for granted because, oh, you know, there's enough for everybody. Like It doesn't, it doesn't mean you do that. Right. Like it just means. It, the way that I got connected to this concept was in my environment, speaking of environment in the Cayman Islands, it's a very, um, like the, the mindset is the opposite of abundance, right? So it's more of scarcity. And because literally there's limited resources because we're a tiny island in the <laughs> middle of the ocean and there's only so many people. And so yeah. like the, the social dynamics are really driven by scarcity yeah. and it, you, you just can't, you can't shift it enough. You can't change the social dynamics of the entire environment sometimes. So you have to change yours. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think it comes into place. And so then it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to take on and absorb this scarcity mindset. I'm going to think differently, but then I'm going to change my environment. And so I changed my environment and then everything else sort of comes together. So you have to align all of those factors for sure. You can't ignore any of them. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, I actually just tweeted about an hour before this that I went and lifted today. And so I, I bettered my mind and my spirit. And as a side effect, my body got stronger. And I do see that <laughs> all, it's all aligned. And even if you told me, hey, your, your body won't get any benefit from working out every day, 
I'd go work out every day just because I feel like that holistic, that I'm more at peace. I'm more calm. I'm more, you know, all these things that, that kind of go into that. I think that's pretty, that's pretty awesome and powerful. Let me ask you a random question that sometimes I ask people sure. that I work with, but it's kind of related. Um, how would you describe yourself at your best? Like, what are you most proud of? Oh, I mean, for sure. Like my family, you know, I'm, I'm at my best when I'm just a dad, when like, I just get to have fun and I'm like throwing my kids up in the air. I'm leading the relay races around the neighborhood. I think of one day in particular where COVID was in the middle of lockdowns and uh, they had closed a park, but we were walking in the neighborhood and I saw a few kids and I said, let's all create a game in this park of like freeze tag. And I'm just the dad running around making, you got to dance now when I tag you, you know, just creating these fun little games and all the other dads and parents were like, man, like, can we do this again? This was the most, my, my kid taught, I got messages on Facebook, people adding me saying, uh, you know, I had to find you because my kid hasn't stopped talking about this in like two weeks, you know? And, and to me, that's, that's life, right? Like, I don't really care. I'm sure there's some people that think I'm weird or I'm dancing around with a bunch of kids I don't know or whatever it is, but I'm just, that's me. I'm a really high energy guy. I want everybody to have a good time. And that, that fatherhood role for me has like, I've gotten to do some really cool stuff, being a professional poker player, traveling the world, doing some really fun things. Nothing compares to that. Like my daughter, like pulling me in and being like, I love you, daddy. You know, like, dude, my heart will just flutter. And I feel like I'm at my best when I, when I get to be a dad, that's my number one thing for sure. That's beautiful. And I think that's how you identify what matters to you and what's important and what your mission can sort of center around, right? That's your reason, your purpose. It is. So, yeah. A lot of people don't have that. And it's so sad that they're lacking some kind of connection to that purpose. But, you know, that's a blessing that you can just easily access that and, and know that about yourself. And it, it, that why kind of led me to getting out of the bank, right? So I could be home more. I mean, my daughter used to cry some mornings when I'd go to the bank because she knew I wasn't coming home until 645. And, and now I get to take her to school anytime I want. I get to pick her up. I'm there for everything. And so that, that was my driving why behind everything, which uh, how about you? Can I turn that question on you and ask you that? Sure. So what do I like about myself? Yeah. Um, well, when I'm feeling the best about myself and most proud about myself, it's really just family too. And, and I think being in this chapter in my life has really made me feel at peace, like being able to have the freedom and the opportunity and to make happen for myself. So I do take credit for part of this is just making all of this happen, but then <laughs> surrendering to to the lifestyle of really just simplifying my life and honoring our family, like Dennis's family is it's his mom, his dad, his brother, wife, and, and three little girls. So we have three That's nieces awesome. and you know, we just we just do simple, simple things. We eat and we hang out and we go for road trips and and whatnot together, but we're really tight-knit family. And I think that that's what it's all about, you know? And so we're, you know, obviously trying to uh, work on our own and that's what I'm looking forward to is just really adding to that and uh, doing more, more mothering. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I, I feel like people will one, look at you and where you got and say, oh, she's lucky. <laughs> you know, they don't see all the like thousands of hours of work you probably put behind the scenes to put yourself in that position, which is amazing. And then, you know, too, I think the simple things in life are everything, right? Like you just described it, the the meal with your family, you know, a picnic in our backyard where nobody else in the world is going to look at that and say, who cares? But like, to me, that's everything, you know, to you just doing that with your nieces and nephews, that might be just that, that is what really floods your soul, you know? And I think, again, too many people focus on the wrong things. They focus on the career, the money, the status, the, and, and really what it all comes back to is relationships, love, like, what are you giving? What are you pouring into people? And those are the most happy people I find. And I feel like that's why you, you kind of radiate this, you exude this happiness, this peace, this calm. And I think that's why I've always, you know, I appreciate you coming on because I've always admired that about you a lot since I've followed you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I, and I feel like now I'm able to be my best self, right? I talk about your ideal self and, and being on that journey myself is what, <laughs> what's allowed me to articulate that for people. I mean, just generally, not just people I work with, but it's not always a piece of cake, right? It took me a long time to get here. And I think that's how I started in this space was really talking about that shift from feminist world and, and ambition and career, and then shifting to more of, I won't say necessarily traditional because I still don't 
consider myself a traditional woman, um, but I, I, you know, it sort of evened out, right? Like I was yeah. on one side and, and now I have the, the, the sort of blend of a modern day woman living a more traditional <laughs> lifestyle, I guess. Yeah, but that's exactly I, how I, I would describe my wife too, because she's the CEO of a small yeah. nonprofit. She runs stuff, she gets stuff, but she's still at the end of the day, just like the greatest mom, the greatest wife. And if you ask her, what's her driving force? That's it. You know, she's up during the middle of the night with babies. She's all the time. That that's her driving force too. So I think that's beautiful. It's a beautiful blend. And you don't, again, you don't have to be in one tribe or the other, you know, and I think that's an important point for everybody. Yeah. It, but you can't have it all at one time. Right. <laughs> you, can, you can have a lifetime to dabble in things here and there, but you better not take for granted when's a good time to do certain things. Uh, but I think that, you know, yeah, like definitely when you know what matters most to you and you're living congruently and aligned to those things, that's when things work out. And it could be different for everybody, you know, slightly different at least. But I think for the most part, women, um, they want to nurture, they want to nest and they want to, to caretake. And so you have to find something that, that you can nourish, you know, with your, with your body, with your mind, with your spirit. Um, and without that, it hardens us, you know, so it is so important to be able to, um, yeah, just find a, a pathway to that. <laughs> I love it. Well, I have one question that came in from Twitter as I just posted that we were going to oh. podcast yesterday. If you're cool sure. answering this, it says, uh, as a relationship es expert, could you please ask Dr. Burroughs, do you ever find where you counsel people and you just say, hey, you two are not made for each other. Uh, you need to just split. Or do you believe that, hey, if everybody puts work in, they can make a relationship work? I thought that was a good question. I'd love your opinion. <laughs> sure, it is a good question. Well, I will say when I was practicing and I was doing marriage therapy with people, I would never say that to them. <laughs> um, but I think now, like in my work, I don't have a lot of active couples that are coming to me together. Like I've had a few and we have worked things out with them. So it's definitely possible if uh, there's some incompatibilities. And I've had some significant in, like couples working with me who have had incompatibilities like uh you know like the breadwinning woman and the stay at home you know or various things yeah. like political ideological uh maybe not being completely aligned <laughs> so you you can work them out but you have to really identify what your deal breakers are and i can't control that right and so i help them decide if this is a deal breaker or is this a trade-off and if it's a trade-off, then you can work on it, but you're going to have to maybe collaborate a little bit there. You're going to have to give on something because that's what a trade-off is. Um, but if it's a deal breaker and you're digging your heels in, then how am I going to help you fix that? <laughs> there's nothing you can ever, there's no magic pills, right? <laughs> All right, that's, exactly. That's, that's a good way to put it. I appreciate that. Well, I want to be respectful of your time too, but we always end every podcast with what I call rapid fire questions. So I'm going to ask you five questions. If you're cool, just first thing that comes off the top of your head. All right. They'll be easy. Okay. Ones, I promise. Uh, what is your favorite and least favorite exercise to do each week? Um, I love step ups. Oh my, you're <laughs> that's the first my... person that's ever said step up. You're the first person I've ever talked to that said step ups. <laughs> yeah, I like the weighted step ups. I do those um, happily. And my least favorite exercise, I don't do the front squat. I can't, my wrists, they don't work that way. I, that. I don't like front squats either. So we're, we're a teammate. We're a team on that. Team no front squats. <laughs> Taylor, Taylor, Tyler and Taylor. Tyler and Taylor. There we go. I like it. Uh, what's your best first date ideas? If you could just throw a few off the top of your head. What's really been working for a lot of clients is going to a farmer's market and Ooh. going through all the like goodies. And it can be like more than just fruits and produce. It could be like some that are street markets. So you can go and explore, interact with people, get some things. Then you're like, oh, we should make this or, oh, we should use this. And so I think that is a really good example of a good first date. Like we go to farmer's market every week here, actually. And I love it. We take all our tri whole tribe of kids. We, we push them through there. And I love it too, because it is right. You can find that you talk to the farmers. It's like, and you got that movement aspect of it. That's, that's, that's perfect. I like that. A lot of, a lot of guys out there are going to watch this and be like, all right, I'm asking farmer's markets now. I like that. Uh, what's the number one or a huge red flag to watch out for early on in dating? 
Entitlement. Entitlement is a big one. And that also sort of bleeds in and overlaps with not taking accountability for things. So, you know, if you're entitled, you're not going to take criticism. You're not going to be humble. You're going to kind of expect things to, to be or people to cater to you and that you deserve things just off the bat. Like there's one thing to have a standard and expect to be respected. Like, you know, you're well-mannered, good people, you should have some level of decency. But when you act like you're more important and need to be catered to and, and can't own up to your mistakes, big red flag. Yeah, that's pretty huge. I always said, and I actually broke up with one gal in Chicago when I was dating for my wife, just she treated wait staff so poorly. It was like this entitlement attitude. And I was like, holy, if you're going to treat people like this, I, I can't, you know, that, that was a big red flag for me. So I like that one. Uh, what's your all-time favorite date movie? Ooh, uh, first thing that comes to my mind. Oh gosh. Um, oh gosh. Ah, <laughs> I'm like blanking. I don't think movies are a good date idea, but if you're going to be like, you that. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to see a movie with someone that you're kind of already settled in, like with, um, then, I mean, I think it's just got to be something that's uh, that both of you can kind of like, right? So it, it depends on the two people, but I definitely don't recommend movies for first dates. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You're sitting there in silence, right? You probably don't know, do I hold her hand? Do I, I don't even know this person. What do I do? There's probably a lot of awkward stuff around there. I like the idea of a farmer's market and get some movement in there, guys. That's going to be the thing. Uh, last one, uh, this one I'm interested in. What's the worst pickup attempt that's ever been made on you or a friend or a client or anyone like that? The worst thing you've ever heard of? <laughs> I have a funny story. So there was this person, I don't even remember their names. So I didn't know them very well, but they were on Facebook and they had me as a friend on Facebook and he messed like private messages me on Facebook for pictures of my feet. <laughs> oh no, oh, no. But he's like, check your email. I just sent you a hundred bucks. Send me pictures of your feet. And I was like, what? Who are you? And then I looked at my email and he sent me a hundred bucks. I'm like, how did you get my email? And I was like, okay, I thought about it for, for, for like 15 minutes. And then I was like, no, I reject. And then I blocked him. <laughs> oh my like, gosh. That's crazy. I, I honestly, I've talked to some of my good friends on Twitter too, like McKinsey and Kelly and some of the, the girls in the fitness space, what they put up with is ridiculous. I don't know if you have to put up with any of this stuff too, but having a six-year-old daughter, I think about, she's going to be this someday. And like, it honestly makes my blood boil that some of the guys will send some of the messages they do. And my brother, Joey, who actually just got engaged like two hours ago, congratulations. Oh, him. Wow. Really big, but uh, he actually will call these guys out because it's, it's now fiance's girl. And he'll be like, Hey bro, you have in your bio, like dad, father, husband, Christian. And why are you sending this like 20 year old girl, this, this thing, you know, like it's pretty creepy. I don't know. There's some crazy stuff, but Hey, I, I want to thank you so much. Bottom of my heart, I, I'm super grateful for you to come on. And, and I feel like you shared a lot of wisdom with people. I'm going to link all of your stuff in, the, in below here because I'd love for people to check out. I want to check out your newsletter, actually. I didn't know you had that, but I'm, I'm a big fan of your YouTube, big fan of your Twitter, Instagram. You share some awesome stuff and some great stuff for relationships, fitness, and just life. Uh, so I appreciate everything you do, Taylor. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me on. This was great fun. And I'm so happy for you and your family. So I appreciate happy to be it. connected to you now a little yeah, bit more. We come to Arizona like once every uh, once a year or so. So maybe maybe we'll shoot you a message. If you guys are ever in Vegas, yes. let me know too. I'd, I'd love to, maybe I can get a workout in with Dennis. You can teach me how to handstand in person, meet my family, things like sure. that. Sure. So. <laughs> Definitely. Sounds All like right. a good plan. Any, any last <laughs> words for the viewers or anything you want to say? Always be betting. <laughs> <laughs> right on brand. I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. This is Ty Rompers No Limit Podcast, episode four with Dr. Taylor Burroughs. Thank you very much. You guys go have the most blessed day of your life. Be, uh, be kind to everybody you interact with and be your best self. Thanks, guys. Have a great one.